I am so glad you're here for another episode of Mechanism Monday, where every Monday we write out the electron pushing arrow mechanisms for different chemical transformations. In last week's video, I asked if you could solve the mechanism for this chemical transformation. So if you haven't had a chance, pause the video now and try it independently. And make sure you stick around to the end because I'll give you another mechanism to solve for next week's video. Upon inspection, this reaction looks incredibly complicated. We see that we have a very long linear chain of carbon atoms, which ultimately turns into two different rings, each containing stereochemical control at several different positions. But ultimately, this is actually just a two-step reaction. And we can break it down by trying to identify the different carbon atoms which make up the different rings. So if we were to look at the functional groups that are present, we see we have an ester here and an ester here. So then it's likely that this is carbon one, meaning that this must be carbon one. We also see that there's a carbonyl group over here. And according to this ring, it would be at, so if this is the second carbon, this is the third, and then this is the fourth, somehow this must become carbon number four. And notice that it's adjacent to a carbon which contains a methyl group. So that five position must be this position which contains this methyl group. So there must be some sort of ring forming reaction or mechanism that allows us to form this six member ring where we can somehow get these different carbons to combine. Because ultimately this only leaves one other carbon which I can't easily identify on this linear chain immediately. So the next thing I'm going to do is look at the different functional groups that are present. So I have an ester here. Here, I see I have a methyl group, a carbonyl ketone, and I also have a thioether at this position. And then I notice that the reaction takes place under basic conditions, so a base is added. And importantly, I know that anytime I have a carbonyl functional group, and a base that I can often form enolates through enolate formation by deprotonation of an alpha carbon hydrogen. Specifically, I see that at this position, which we could call the alpha carbon, contains a hydrogen which could be deprotonated to form an enolate species. So if we're to consider that to be the very first step, then we can deprotonate this carbon hydrogen bond, move the electrons here to make a brand new alkene, kicking up these pi electrons to make a negatively charged oxygen. So now I can redraw the starting material just using the formation of that enolate species. So I have these different carbons here. I know that there's a pi bond at this location. I know that I still have this methyl group located here. Now with a new pi bond between these two carbons, a negatively charged oxygen, and the rest of the molecule remains the same. So now from here, I know that there was a pi bond, and this is what the product of this transformation would look like. Now remember that these alkyl chains, because they're sp3 hybridized, can actually wiggle around and flop and rotate between all of these different carbon-carbon bonds. So it's actually possible that I redraw this molecule in a different orientation. And since I know that I have to form some sort of cyclic ring, I'm going to try to orient it in such a way to help me see how that ring might be forming. So if I start where this enolate species has been formed, then I have a new carbon-carbon double bond. I know that this methyl group is still present here. And then perhaps I can see that I have another carbon going up another carbon going down, one going in this direction, and then one going in this direction. And that got me to this carbon, to this carbon, and then to this carbon. And I know that the next carbon contains that double bond on it. So that double bond could be placed here with my ester located at this position. And then the other side of the molecule looks just like this, where I have my thioether or sulfur with a phenyl group attached to it. Now importantly, I could have drawn this double bond going in the opposite direction because remember, this carbon-carbon bond can rotate freely. And if we are to draw it that way, then maybe you could start to see how the next reaction would take place. Because now we have a situation where we have a diene, because there are two alkenes located here, and I also have an alkene on this side, which has a, an electron withdrawing group on it. And importantly, that should set off some bells, because anytime you have a diene and an alkene with an electron withdrawing group on it, we call that a dienophile. Now, anytime you have a diene and a dienophile, that should alert you that there may be a Diels Alder type of reaction happening, where you can do a cyclic ring formation, kind of like we have in our final product, because we see that we have our diene and our dienophile. And in fact, that is what happens. So we can form our new ring, placing a new pi bond adjacent to the carbon with the carbonyl group on it. And that is actually how we close this ring and we also form a five member ring here and here. So the product of that transformation, we still are gonna end up with our 
negatively charged oxygen species here because this was still negatively charged. We have now formed our six-membered ring. We have an alkene at this position. We still have our SPH located two carbons away, so we still have that. We've now generated our ester at this position, and we have also closed this five-membered ring giving us our hydrogen located here and our methyl group located at this position. And then from here, what can happen is these pi electrons, which are located on this oxygen, can come back down. These pi electrons can move here, and this will actually kick off a really great leaving group in this thiolate species which could form to generate our final product. So I would encourage you when doing these different types of mechanisms, if you have the orientation of a molecule drawn in one direction, feel free to play around with the different carbon-carbon bonds that are flexible and can rotate in three-dimensional space in order to reorient the molecule in a way where we can identify what sort of reactions may take place. Because ultimately, getting it into this orientation allows you to easily identify the diene and the dienophile that allows for this Diels-Alder reaction to take place to form our bicyclic ring, which ultimately allows us to generate our product. And if you want to check out the publication that contains this paper, I would encourage you to check out Chemical Communications, published in 1991, and the page number was 1168, in case you have access to journals and you want to take a look at this reaction in much more detail. If you enjoyed this week's mechanism, make sure to give it a thumbs up down below. For next week's video, I'd love to see if you could figure out the mechanism for this chemical transformation. Drop it as a comment down below if you have any ideas, and make sure that you subscribe to the channel so that you never miss another Mechanism Monday. I'll see you next week.